is what are lease tenancy and house rent agreements and how to negotiate all these things so generally we know okay, when we there is a landlord and there is a tenant lessee and lesser all these are terms you guys know but the most important things while you are dealing with rent is the agreement agreements terms and condition etc so the agreement for renting a property is a one legal document that almost no one can avoid you might have to negotiate or at least you know sign one either for personal or business use uh, and surprisingly we all know we hear from so many people okay, how few people take the opportunity to negotiate or even understand these arguments property owners occupiers all so most people have little idea as to what to look out for in these agreements so today we are going to see the terms of agreements whether it is a residential or commercial uh, whether you are dealing with leasing renting or leave and license agreements etc so this is an important session if you want to educate your clients who want to rent out or even if they want to stay or work from a rented premises so while each house rent or lease agreement has its unique situation and that can merit unit terms and condition to be inserted in a contract there are some crucial terms that should always be included in agreement to protect interest and prevent future misunderstanding otherwise you know it can potentially lead you to trouble dispute financial losses or litigation even so let's see what are the most common legal relationships you may enter while renting a house or commercial property number 1 is a lease so a lease is a transfer of the right to use the property in question which may be for a specified period or even for perpetuity provided that a price is paid for the same if the landlord does not want to create a lease in perpetuity it would be better to specify a time period in the lease agreement otherwise it will go on and on forever so it is not possible it this is very important it is not possible to evict the lease holder while the lease is in existence unless there is a provision for terminating the lease agreement provided in the lease agreement itself so what if a lease leads to a tenancy now most indian state now have enacted tenancy laws or rent control legislations which place a ceiling on a rent that can be charged on lease property and also severely restrict the ground on which the tenancy can be terminated so keeping in these two things in mind we have to check the agreements and prepare the agreements accordingly if you are a lessee or lesser so lessee is called a statutory tenant in such cases so property in premium location in mumbai you know the property in premium location in mumbai and other cities have been leased on what is today considered to be a nominal rent like so many properties are rented or 100 rupees 200 rupees or 300 rupees per month uh, which is totally impractical but as the pace of inflation and increase in property prices was many times higher than the corresponding increase in rent permitted under tenancy law so this causes severe financial loss to the owner of these properties so while the owner so while the owners have very valuable property in their ownership they cannot enjoy the value of the same as they can neither charge market rate of rent nor can they evict the existing tenants 
सो देर फॉर पर्सन लीजिंग देर प्रॉपर्टी मस्ट एंश्योर दट द लेटिंग ऑफ प्रॉपर्टी ऑन रेंट डज नॉट क्वालिफाई एज अ टेनेंसी अंडर रेंट कंट्रोल लेजिस्लेशन एंड दिस हैज टू बी डन थ्रू केयरफुल लीगल ड्राफ्टिंग एंड दैट्स वाई दिस सेशन सो नेक्स्ट इज लीव एंड लाइसेंस so what is a leave and license a leave and license agreement is one of the most popular ways adopted by parties to ensure that the letting of property does not amount to a lease under tenancy rented legislation so unlike a tenancy or lease a leave and license agreement does not create any property right in favor of the person who occupies the house that means license licensee so in case of tenancy as well as lease the right to use the property gets transferred from the owner to the person who is renting out the place however no such transfer of right to use take place in leave and license agreements there is only a license given to the licensee for limited use of the property in a certain way the terms of the license govern what are the right of licensee but means the per licensee the person who rented the house and this is the form of agreement most preferred by landlord an 11 month leave and license agreement for residence property have become a norm all over india so lease agreements are common only with respect to common prop commercial properties so this is to be noted so what are the advantages of leave and license so due to the difficulty of getting a tenant or lease holder to vacant a place most landlord prefer to enter into leave and license agreement for a contractually specified period after which the licensee is obligated to vacate the premises so main important thing is here that okay, you set a term after which the licensee will leave the place under a leave and license the amount of rent can be contractually determined by parties and also increase in rent in case of renewal of the agreement further the lesser or owner has greater freedom with respect to termination of the license and eviction of the lessee so if you are a landlord this is important for you so if it is a common practice to grant leave and license agreement only for 11 months or less to avoid being classified as tenancy leave and license agreement also do not attract the rent control act that once plagued many residential property owners so if the license licensee and the landlord agree to continue the arrangement and renew the agreement they may enter into a fresh leave and license agreement for 11 months at a time a lease however is for a longer duration of time usually for one year or more although there is no minimum or maximum period specified by law a lease creates a property right in favor of the lessee and leases are more common for commercial properties as opposed to residential properties which are usually let out on basis of leave and license so how to ensure an effective lease deed or leave and license agreement based on the things we uh, went through in last few slides so find out who is the actual owner it is very crucial that a leave or license or lease agreement is signed only with the real owner of the house find out who is the owner and even demand to see some papers establishing the name and identity of the owner you can request the owner to examine the title deeds of the property which will mention how land was originally allotted by a government authority etc and how its ownership transferred this document should be requested before paying the security deposit or making any advance payment sorry electricity bill or bills relating to municipal taxes can also be referred to although they are not very reliable indicators or ownership 
it is more difficult to trace ownership of agricultural land which may have been transferred through several private hands through intestate succession partitions intra family transfer etc for hundreds of years so if the person leasing the property is not the owner of the land find out if he has the authority to lease it if the person entering into the contract is not the owner but someone else you should check whether he has the authority to lease the property usually a power of attorney can suffice for the purpose so if you fail to enter into contract with the real owner but enter into an agreement with someone who is not the real owner without due authority to enter into contracts then the real owner may at any point of time evict you from the premises and you will have the status of trespasser in the eyes of law so while you get your agreements done get all these things checked while it may be possible to recover your costs from the person who misrepresented himself as being capable of letting out the property to you but it will require a difficult and sometimes prolonged legal battle which should be best avoided and in such cases you may even register an fir alleging fraud so also in the agreement itself it is desirable to insert a warranty clause on behalf of the lesser stating that he is a bona fide owner of the premises and that he has the requisite unfettered right to rent out lease or give on license the premises in question an indemnity clause can also be inserted in cases there is a breach of this warranty making the owner liable to make good all the losses arising out of such breach of warranty so how do you rent out a mortgage property sometime a property to be rented out will be mortgaged with a bank or some other financial institution in which case they would retain the registered sale document right bank will have all the registered document in that case the owner would require a no objection certificate from the bank or the financial institution failing to do this would be a violation of the mortgage agreement and in case the bank tries to recover money by selling the property it may jeopardize the right of the occupant which must be kept in mind and provided for in the agreement now terms of the agreement so what is the duration of lease or the license this is very important to specify any mistake in this regard can be very costly for the landlord for lease and license agreement a term of no more than 11 month is desirable commercial leases are often of long duration sometime running into 5 6 year as well in case of factories cinema halls and such other properties leases can be multi decades or even multi century long and in case of lease of restaurant or any property with significant setup or installation cost should be of a longer duration please hold emne kehne ke madi gayo che document so that the lessee would make a lot of investment in the installation and set up gets enough time to exploit his investments so now termination clause and notice period how this should be included in the agreement so most property related dispute between landlord occupant usually take place over termination and eviction right it is hence very important to clearly specify in the agreement as to how and in what circumstances the agreement can be terminated usually provision is made for both fault based and no fault based termination fault based termination rights are triggered when one party breaches any terms and condition of the agreement no fault termination is when the parties can terminate the agreement without citing any reason so what if you get a place like this and then get prematurely terminated so due to the difficulty and cost associated with finding a new premise 
as well as finding a new occupant, both landlords and tenants are usually not too happy to have easy no-fault termination clause. Hence, leaving the premises is often made difficult by throwing a long-term notice period and even lock-in periods. So this is very common in commercial property leasing. So in any case, it is common practice to include a clause stating that either of the parties can terminate the contract and the manner in which the termination notice shall be served and the duration of the notice period. The notice period is essentially the time other party gets to make alternative arrangements or brace for the termination before it is actually terminated. One month notice period means that the party willing to terminate the contract must notify the other party at least one month before he actually intend to terminate the contract. One month and three month notice period are most common in India, although sometimes party can insist or in even longer notice period. Even if the owner wants to sell the property, he must respect the notice close. Now we'll discuss some important clauses which can come into agreement at various time at according to the nature of agreement. So it cannot, it may not come in one agreement, but this causes and its implication we'll discuss. So one is lock-in clause. Some agreements have a lock-in clause. The lock-in clause of a leave and license or lease agreement states that a tenant cannot leave the rented property or terminate the agreement for a specified period of time during which the contract is locked in. The period is commonly referred to as lock-in period. If the tenant leaves the rented property, he or she would be required to continue to pay the rent until the lock-in period is over. For example, if the lock-in period is for one year, and tenant wants to leave after four months, then unless he is able to negotiate something better with the landlord, he must either retain the place until the end of the year despite giving notice or vacate the place but keep paying for the entire year's rent anyway. So lock-in period is more common in lease agreement as opposed to leave and license agreement. The occupant should be wary of this clause especially if he is unsure about how long he intends to occupy the property. If the landlord insists on adding this clause, the tenant can try and add a provision for it to not apply in exceptional circumstances. Uh, for example, if the lock-in clause will not apply if the tenant is transferred to another city by his employer. And if the uh, landlord agrees to it, then the lock-in clause will be null and void in this circumstances. Another is subletting clause. It is common practice to specifically prohibit subletting. Otherwise, the landlord would lose control over what kind of people are allowed to stay in the property. If subletting is not prohibited, the occupant may sublet the property to undesirable people on whose conduct there will be no control of the landlord. So in case of property such as restaurant, factories or any other property with major investment in installation costs, it is important to have less strict subletting clause. Ideally, there should be no restriction on subletting given the nature of the restaurant business where management often changes hand frequently. In any case, the agreement should at least include a clause where upon paying a specified fee to the owner, subletting will be allowed. Third is payment clause, which is very important. Apart from specific obligation to pay and the amount of rent, license fee or lease fee, the agreement should be very clear about when the payment obligation arises. There should be no doubt as to on what date, what amount become payable. That should be clear. The rent should be paid on this, this, that, etc. or any other payment. It is also justifiable to specify what will be the mode of payment, such as check, cash or internet transfer and to whom the payment is to be made. Sometimes the security deposit is adjusted against the last few months rent, which should also be specified in the agreement. The consequences in case of delay in payment, usually penal interest in the range of 12 to 18 percent, in case there is more than 10 days of delay, can also be specified. 
so this percentage number of days delay you can discuss with uh, both the parties and get it included increase in rent close many a time landlord may sleep in vag rent increase that gives him the power to increase it any time if market price changes so the perception of market price can widely differ from person to person hence it is the duty of licensees or lessees to keep such clause out of the agreement some lease agreements specify that every year the rent will increase by 10% in which case it would be a good idea to clarify whether there is a simple increment or a compound increment in case of leave and license agreement since such agreements are anyway only for 11 months rent increase clauses are unusual and should be negotiated hard by occupants the agreement should specify that unless specifically provided in the agreement there will be no rent increase during the term of the agreement so all this clause should be discussed while you are making rent agreement with your landlord or the person who has taken on rent now the guarantor clause the landlord may insist on a guarantor clause there though this is not a common practice in case any default is made by the occupant the guarantor can be called on to make the loss is good this is rarely used clause but very effective in case of dispute between landlord and occupant so this this may this is again a case to case basis if you think this property uh, uh may need a guarantor uh, the nature of the landlord or person who has taken on rent is you know aggressive or something like that you might want to include a guarantor and guarantor clause then comes a maintenance or association charges clause so in case of an apartment or house rented in the society there may be a fixed monthly maintenance charges of or association charges by the society the usual practice is for the landlord to pay the maintenance association charges although he can transfer the same on the occupant through the agreement the agreement should have a clause stating who is going to bear those expenses the agreement should specify who would bear all electricity water and other utility charges if any so this should be there now comes a wear and tear clause so certain feature of the property are bound to deteriorate over the period of time like your paint of the house occupants should not be held responsible for such normal wear and tear are talking about normal wear and tear the agreement should contain a wear and tear clause stating that occupant will return the property in the condition in which he received it subject to normal wear and tear as long as the same was not caused by any direct act or negligence clause for furniture and fixtures if a piece of furniture is no longer working or becomes unfit to use as a result of everyday wear and tear then the landlord is required to replace or repair the item the landlord cannot charge the tenant or withhold the deposit for items which are unusable due to everyday wear and tear a specific clause should be entered into the agreement for this purpose however if an occupant would damage a piece of furniture or equipment through improper use or carelessness the landlord is allowed to charge the tenant for the damage or withhold all or part of the deposit up to the amount of loss this fixtures like furniture electrical appliances etc in the premises must be listed counted and the details of the same should be added as an annex to the agreement the occupant should be required to ensure in the agreement that this remain in working condition and undamaged throughout his possession of the property the wear and tear clause must apply to these items as well clause on associated facilities and amenities many properties come along with facility like parking space use of swimming pool club gym etc which owner is entitled to along with the property however these rights do not transfer to the licensee or the lessee unless a clause is inserted into agreement 
specifying that such incidental amenities and associated facility will be accessible by the occupant. Security deposit clause. Essential purpose of security deposit is for the convenience of rectifying errors in rent, damage to property, unpaid electricity or phone bills, and any other miscellaneous cause <coughs> sorry, that remain <coughs> that remain unpaid by the occupant. The amount is often in the multiple of the monthly rent. For example, the security deposit can be amount equivalent to three or six month rent. Sorry. <clears throat> the security deposit is refundable less the cost of any damage on reposition that landlord and is normally interest free. A proper, proper clause should be inserted in the agreement that the security deposit will be refunded to the tenant on reposition of the property by the landlord. It should also clearly state whether this deposit is interest free. It should also, there should also be a clause in the level license or lease agreement addressing the consequences of failure in part of the landlord to return the security deposit in timely manner. Agreement should provide that a certain interest will be charged on the security if it is held back beyond the date on which it is supposed to be returned to the occupant under the contract. This clause can also state that a penal amount will be charged on the security deposit for every day of delay by the occupant to leave the premises after the term of the lease or the leave and license is over. The security deposit clause should also specify as to what kind of penalty can be charged by the landlord under what circumstances against the security deposit maintained with him. Now comes the repair works during occupancy. The agreement should specify who would be responsible for what kind of repairs. Small repair work without significant financial burden should be covered by the occupant, but the cost of significant repair works which are necessary to keep the premises in livable and usable condition should be negotiated upon and allocated for in the agreement. If not specified, this often leads to disputes between parties. If nothing is specified, then occupant may be obliged to carry out even major repairs to keep a house in livable condition. The agreement should specify if the occupant is under an obligation to report any damage to property to the landlord and how much time may lapse before such reporting. Now clause for tax liability. Tax liability may come out of renting out a property, especially in case of commercial properties. It is desirable that the party should allocate responsible responsibility for payment of service taxes, property and municipal tax and water tax in the agreement. This should be clearly mentioned. Further, you should note that in certain cases tax is to be deducted at source, what we call TDS, on rent payment. This reduces the actual amount of payment received by the lesser in order to prevent confusion in the future. It is safer to specify whether TDS can be deducted from the rent amount or whether the amount specified as rent is amount left after deduction of TDS in which case the rent payment must be grossed up known as a tax gross up. What is this? If nothing is specified, tax liability would usually fall on the landlord. Even without mentioning as such, occupant may be able to deduct TDS in any case. Now dispute resolution clause. This clause refers to the court which will have authority to resolve the dispute in case there arises any dispute between the landlord and the tenant. Normally it is the court which has jurisdiction over the city in which the property is located or the court which has jurisdiction in the city where the landlord resides. A clause to submit the dispute to arbitration through this clause is possible and in most cases will be very desirable, especially agreement involving significant money. General nuisance clause. General nuisance clause is to prevent occupant from carrying out 
or permitting other to carry out undesirable act that might cause nuisance to the landlord or the neighbors. Landlord often prefer to make this a trigger for termination without notice. Although this is almost certain to be disputed and not very practical in reality. So general points of concern regarding leasing or renting of any nature. So apart from the above mentioned clauses, the tenant and landlord should be aware of other basic and peculiar details of their legal relationship imposed by law. For instance, a tenant should be aware of the fact that a landlord's permission is required before initiating any major changes to the property. The document should be wary of clauses allowing for automatic increase in rent, arbitrary amendments to the existing terms of the agreement by the landlord and any provision that permits the landlord to enter the property at any time. So this was what called lease tenancy, leave and license and we saw advantage of leave and license and we saw some checklists to ensure effective lease deed or leave and license agreement like you should find out who is the actual owner, how can we rent out mortgage property, uh, what can be the terms of the agreement and some important clauses we discussed which is to be included in the agreement on a case to case basis. Thank you very much for your time. If you have any question, please send us email on mgmatrimax.in and we'll be happy to address.